Hi guys, my name is Bobby. Welcome back to my channel. And today I'm bringing you my February wrap up. Now you're probably wondering where my March TBR is. Um, I didn't do one. Um, the end of February ended up being very, very stressful for me in the last week and a half. I'm still in the middle of this stressful bullshit. Um, don't really want to talk about it, but I'm hoping things will resolve in the next month or so. I'm not sure. And so my reading took a nosedive and I just zoned out. Like it's, it's been a rough couple of weeks and we're still kind of in the middle of it. So today is March 5th. I haven't picked up a single thing in the month of March yet. I'm just going to let myself mood read. I do want to read, but nothing looks good. So like everything and nothing looks good at the same time. So I'm struggling. Um, I think I need to buy more books because I'm trying, I, you know, you say that, but I'm trying to read stuff that I already have physically on my TBR so that I can get rid of my red TBR or my red TBR my physical TBR and, you know, either donate the ones that I don't want to keep or, you know, just so I have room for more books. Like you understand what I'm saying. Um, once February was a good reading month for me, I read, I finished five books and there's two that I started. One I'm barely into and one I'm in the middle of and I have thoughts on both. Um, but I did not finish them. So I'll probably talk about those first. But there was five that I did finish. I started out the month really well and like just going full bore audiobooks all the way and just doing fabulous. And then about middle of the month and towards the end when the shit storm in my life slammed into me, then it was just like, bleh. so I mean, not that I put out much content anyways, but that's why you don't have a March TBR because I literally did not know what I wanted to read because nothing sounded good and when I'm really stressed out or upset about something I don't read because I can't focus but I'm going to try to pick up something today I've been trolling through Scribd and Audible in my library I do have two holds that came in on my library but I'm not sure I'm in the mood for either of them and there's tons of holds on them so I think I'm just gonna let them go back so other people can read them because as of right now I don't really care I want you know, I don't want to feel the pressure of having to read it within the two weeks because that's all my library gives for audiobooks. You have 14 days and I just don't want that pressure. So hopefully I'll find something to read today. That's my goal is to read today. Well, film this, edit and post this and then read. I mean, I worked already. I worked an eight hour shift this morning. It's already what, 1.30 in the afternoon. So I'm trying, I'm trying to get my shit together. So I think to start, we will talk about the two books that I did not finish but have thoughts on. So the first one is one that was I had on hold for my library and I was waiting for it to come in. So this one I got on audio hold for my library um, and I got to chapter seven. So about 50 pages in, 56 pages in. And I was in the middle of, I just started reading this when the shit storm hit my life. So I put it down and I didn't pick it back up when I felt like reading. I actually picked up and read and finished another book instead of picking this one back up. And I don't know why. The other one I finished in two days and I guess I was just more engaged in it. This one, and I feel bad about it, um, but that's The Library of the Unwritten by A.J. Hackwith. This was a gift from Mel, my friend Mel, and she... <laughs> She gave it to me and she said that she read it and liked it. And this is a trilogy. There's three books. Um, my library has the audio for all three, I believe. And I know Audible does too, but I believe my library does. So I started this, got 56 pages into it. And uh, this is an adult book. So the premise of this book is there is um, a character named Claire. She is a librarian of the Library of the Unwritten in Hell. So this library has all the unwritten books from authors that are kept in this library and Claire is the librarian. She takes care of it. So on occasion, there will be characters in these unwritten or unfinished books that will jump out and try to escape either to go to earth to find their author or whatever to try to get them to finish their story. Like they think they're real, but they're just characters in a book. And when this happens, she has ways to stop them and put them back in their stories. Cool concept, right? So I started it. She's got a uh, muse named Brevity that works with her. And there is a book that escapes from the library and they have to go to Earth to find it. Well, it's in Seattle. The author I looked, she lives in Seattle, which is cool because I live in Washington. So 
like where they first land is like near Pike Place Market. Most people who have heard of Seattle know about Pike Place Market. So that's kind of cool. But I just, I just wasn't into it. Like I just couldn't get into it. So it's a hero from a book and he has found his author and he's like kind of semi dating her and trying to convince her to finish her book, like inspire her. And Claire has said, she says in the 50 pages that I read, like that's bad to do. Like you will damage the author like mentally by doing this because it, they're literally meeting their character in person. And this author has written this character. And if it is a hero in a story, then theoretically this hero, cause this is a female author, that this hero is her ideal man is kind of the gist that I got. And for him to show up in her life and just, I don't know, like be perfect, like it's going to ruin her for any other possible relationship she could ever have. So you have that concept. And then when she finally gets him away from her and she's going to put him back in his book, he starts acting weird and she realizes that something's wrong. And he gave the first couple of chapters of his story to the author. So I'm assuming this is not an unfinished book. This is a book that she just hasn't written yet. And he's trying to hurry up and get her to write it. Because from what I understand or the gist is that once these stories are written, then they leave the library of the unwritten and, you know, they're able to live on in people's minds and blah, blah, blah. So where I stopped, like things were getting complicated. There's also an angel in here who like some spirit gets up to heaven and he says that he has like the book of the dead or book of the devil or something like that to where it can blur the lines between heaven and hell. So this angel is going back down to earth to try to find this book and runs into the librarian and librarian and the people that she's with, which is her muse, um, Brevity and this demon named Leto and like just shit kind of ensues. I put it down because I was kind of bored. Like it just, it didn't grab me the way I thought it was going to. I mean, the whole concept of being a library of the unwritten in hell is a really cool concept, but I was just kind of like, okay, like, I don't know. It just, it didn't grab me. And then with everything that was happening in my personal life, I just didn't feel the need to pick it back up. And then my loan expired at the library. So now I'd have to put a hold on it again. And honestly, I don't know if I'm interested enough to pick it back up. So I think I am just going to DNF it and give it to my friend, Sarah. I'm really sorry, Mel. I tried. Mel said that she didn't particularly love it, but it was good. But I just, I just wasn't getting into it. And usually I give a book a little bit more than 50 pages, but the fact that I set it down and then was able to pick up another book and read it in two days in its entirety and not really come back, want to come back to this one is kind of telling for me. So I think this is going to be an official DNF and an official donate. I mean, it's not bad. I mean, the concept sounded super good, but as I was reading it, just those 50 pages, it seemed to skew a little bit more YA and the way the characters were written, even though it's not YA. And like, I don't know. I just, I don't know, I just wasn't feeling it. Next is the book that everybody's been reading and I am halfway through and haven't finished it yet. Um, and that's The House of Sky and Breath by Sarah J. Mass. This was very nicely gifted to me by Becca from Becca in the Books for Christmas. Um, sh she got me, everything she's gotten me, I think, has all been Sarah J. Mass. No, wait, she got me Fortuna Sworn once, but everything else has pretty much been Sarah J. Mass. This is a thick bitch. This is over 800 pages. I am a, like a, almost exactly halfway through. I'm almost 400 pages in and I stopped reading it. I read 300, what am I at? 367. I read 367 pages in the first day, two days. Super easy to get through, but I have issues with this fucking series. Um, everybody's loving this and giving it five stars. I got bored. <laughs> Again, it's kind of the same thing with House of House of Earth and Blood, which I finally finished last month, and that took me over a year to finish. And it's not the author, it's not the story. Well, no, it is the story. It's not the author because I read the entire um, Akatar trilogy in a week, like binged it, and those are not big small books either. And uh, Court of Silver Flames, read that in a day, two days, absolutely loved it. I even am, what, on the fifth book of The Throne of Glass, and I am more into Throne of Glass, which is YA, than I'm into her adult series, and I do not understand what the fuck is going on. So, Pira from Pira Ford explained my feelings literally exactly how I feel, like, in her video, so I'll try to remember to link it down below, uh, where she goes over it, because 
how she felt in the spoiler section is exactly how I fucking feel. Now I've spoiled myself for the ending. I already know I'm really terrible. I happen to be looking at the back to make sure my book wasn't damaged because a couple of my friends ended up getting damaged copies. And I saw there was something that jumped out at me just looking. And so then because I can't help myself, um, I read like the last chapter or the last like five, six pages of the chapter. So I am spoiled for the big twist at the end. And I'm not happy about it. Um, I, I don't I don't like it. So I guess. OK, kind of semi spoilers. I know most of my subscribers really don't give a fuck about Sarah J Maas. Um, if you've read it, then skip ahead um, or no, don't skip ahead if you haven't read it and you want to skip ahead. Um, but I'm going to give some spoilers. There's a cross. OK, spoilers now. There's a crossover that happens between this world and the Akatar world, and it happens at the very end of the book, which means it's going to set up everything for the books continuing. I don't like it. It kind of pisses me off. This is her only, like, true adult series. I mean, Akatar, I think, skews more adult than YA, but I actually enjoyed that series way more. I like the characters more. I like the world. And this, um, in this series, which there's, this is book two, it's supposed to be all adult. And it is but it's not like there is way more smut in the Akatar series than there is in this series. And like I've said before, I don't need smut to make it adult, but there, I don't know like this, the world building, the world is really cool. And the world building is pretty, pretty elaborate. And I knew the worlds were going to cross over at some point, but this just feels forced and too early. Like if the crossover happened in like book three or four, where these characters more established in their world and I'm more attached to them. Like, I really don't give a fuck about the characters in this story. Like I did about like Resand and Feyre and Cassian and Azrael and like everybody from the Akatar series. Like I really liked them and cared about them. And you know, where you get really attached and you don't want anything to happen to them. With Bryce and Hunt, I really don't give a fuck. Like I don't really like them as a couple. I mean, they're, I, I want them to be together like as Endgame, but it wasn't like like Feyre and Resand, or even um, like the the main couple in Throne of Glass or couples, throuples, like the the romances in Throne of Glass. I care about way more about them than I do about Bryce and Hunt. I care way more about the Akatar relationships than I do about Bryce and Hunt. In book one, as they were getting to know each other and like flirting and bantering, it was nice. We get to this one, I'm like, great, they're going to be together, you know, and they are, but they aren't. Like, they start off the book and they have this pact to, like, not sleep together till winter solstice. So they're still doing the flirty banter like they did in book one. And it felt so forced. Like, these are adults. They're not teenagers. They're full-fledged, grown-ass adults. Like, Hunt is over 200-something years old. And uh, Bryce is, what, in her mid-20s? So it's like, you guys are adults. And Bryce has been promiscuous in her past and it was discussed in book one so she's not shy about sex she's not scared about it they're just it just did not make sense to me to have this forced tension that didn't need to be there it just didn't make sense it just felt really fake and it made me just really not give a shit like really not care because it wasn't believable to me if you are an adult relationship and you've been together for a year or so or like I think I don't even know if this takes place over a year between book one and two. I think it's more like months. But if you're a grown ass adult and you've done the flirting and you guys have literally saved each other's lives, pretty much made a commitment to each other, talked about being mates, yet you're not going to, you know, in the Fey world, like sleeping together, like really bonds the mating bond. And it takes you over 400 pages to get there. 400 pages of book two in an established adult relationship. And like I said, I don't have to have the smut, but if you're just like, even if it's off page, even if you guys are sleeping together off page and it's not even explicitly on the page, but we know you guys are fucking great because you're an adult relationship, especially in a new relationship. When you're, when you first get together and you sleep with someone for the first time, most time you're fucking like rabbits. Cause that's everything's new. You know, the attraction is like, it's the honeymoon stage. All you're doing is fucking. And in this, oh, we're just going to not do anything. We're going to wait till winter solstice. So we're still going to flirt and act like we don't, you know, we haven't expressed our feelings yet for 460 something pages. Like, it just doesn't make sense. It's forced to me. It feels like very, very much forced tension that doesn't need to be there. Now, I really enjoyed Rune. I liked seeing him getting a little bit more action in this book so far. I mean, 
I've already spoiled myself for the ending and I already know what happens and I know all the big reveals. So am I really motivated to fully finish this? No. Will it take me another year to probably finish it? Yes. That That's kind of where I'm at. And like I've watched spoiler vlogs on it. There's nothing. And from it's weird because I have people like me who believe that it's really slow in slogs like Piera. And then there's somebody like Bethany from Beautifully Bookish Bethany who thinks that it was super fast paced. While there is action and stuff going on, they're throwing, she's throwing in way more characters. So it gets a little bit more confusing and convoluted. Um, and it's just to set up this crossover to the Akatar series where she falls through a portal and she is now in Prithian and is right in front of Reese and Feyre. And ever, so for me, it's like, okay, what happens next now? So in book three of Crescent City, are we just going to do a half and half where we're with our characters who are in Midgard or, and then half where we're with Bryce and Prithian with Reese and the gang? Like for me, it's like, did you paint yourself in a corner where you feel like you need Reese to come save your ass? I mean, it's to the point where I almost want to be like, fuck this and just binge listen to the Akatar series again. And it's, I'm really disappointed because, you know, Becca's the one that forced me into Sarah J Mass, And I really do love the Akatar series a lot. I have stalled on re finishing Throne of Glass and it's not, it's because it's YA and I really am tired of Selena. Um, like I, well, where I'm at, that's not her name anymore, but still like Elin's Selena. Like I, I'm just kind of sick of her, sick of her shit, sick of her um, uh, chosen one stuff. Like if I could have just a series on the Throne of Glass witches, like I would be happy. I am going to finish it someday, but I just... I think the reason I haven't read books five, six, and seven is because five I'm excited to read. I do not want to read Tower of Dawn. And then, you know, of course, I want to read Kingdom of Ash. Like, I want to get there. Maybe I'll just do that. Maybe I'll just read everything else but this. Because I love her writing. I love the relationships that she builds. But this is your adult series, bitch. And you're just... Ugh, it almost like she. It almost feels like she's regressing. Her world building is amazing. Her diversity is getting a lot better. But I'm tired of, like, this book and the first one where, like, the middle three or 400 pages is a slog, and then it's breakneck pace to the end, and then all of a sudden it, we're slammed against a wall, and then we have to wait two years for the next book. So I have not finished this one. It'll probably take me a year to do so. I have it on audio. I got it right the day it came out. But, man, I'm, like, I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed, and I don't know, I don't know what to do with that. So unpopular opinion. And honestly, right where it's at, and even how I know the ending is, this will be lucky if it's a four star. It's definitely not a five. But yeah, halfway through this, don't know when I'm going to finish it. It's going to be, it's going to be the, uh, what do they call it? The albatross around my neck for probably the next year. Okay, sorry if the angles changed. I am so scared to film a long video that after 20 minutes or so of raw footage, then I'm taking my phone down and like putting it on the computer to make sure I don't lose footage like I did last time. So apologies if the angle changes on occasion. This is why. It's not that I'm an idiot. Well, I guess I am because I won't spend money on a fancy ass camera. But again, this is why. So I apologies ahead of time if the angle changes at all. Okay, so now we're going to go in the order that I finished these five books. And the first book that I read in the month of February is A History of All Places by Shay Earnshaw. Now, I like Shay Earnshaw. Well, I like The Wicked Deep by her. Um, that is a YA. This is an adult book. So this is like, how do I describe the story? This tells the story of, what's the name of the town? Pastoral. I don't even remember where it's at. It's somewhere, is it in Florida? I don't even remember. It's somewhere out in the middle of the woods. And there's this guy named Travis who is hired or, yeah, hired by this woman's parents, this woman named Maggie. Maggie has disappeared. She went, she went to go write a book or do, she's an author. She went to go do something and went on this hike in the woods or whatever and disappeared. So they, her parents hired Travis to go find her. Travis has this unique ability that when he touches objects, he can see the person who owns the said object and like a shadow of them and like what they did or where they went. So he does that and follows her and follows her shadow and ends up going into the woods and then he is never heard from again. And then you get the perspective, like you jump to this perspective of this couple who live in Pastoral, which is this hidden town or community in the middle of the woods 
where there is this thing called the rot where they have to stay in their community. They can't go past the borders or the rot that's in the trees can get them. And if they were to get infected, they could infect their entire community. So they don't let anybody in or out of their community. And you're following three people who live in the community. Um, B, what is it? B, Theo, and Kala. So Kala and B are sisters and Theo is married to Kala. And so you follow, they all live together in this house and you follow them living in the community and like how they survive and all that stuff. And it was, it was interesting. So if you've ever seen the movie, The Village, it definitely has village vibes. Only the, this community knows that there is a community that it, they know the world exists outside. They just think that there's this rot in the woods to where they can't cross because this community has been there for years. And before they used to be able to go in and out to town, go to hospitals if somebody was sick or, you know, giving birth, you know, that kind of thing. And it was kind of like a community that where that was established where these people just decided they wanted to live off the grid and that was fine. Well, now there's this rot that surrounds their community so nobody can leave. So they're kind of trapped there. And the story goes from there. Now, I gave this three stars. I liked the premise. I liked the premise of this weird, creepy, not, well, this weird community in the woods. And, you know, you have these two people who have disappeared and where have they gone? And, you know, this rot and all this stuff. But I didn't like the conclusion, I guess. Not necessarily the ending, because the ending wasn't terrible. It was the why. It was the why of the rot and the why of certain things and like why Travis and Maggie were missing that I didn't really like and I didn't like the the why of the rot, I guess. Everything else was very atmospheric. Shay Earnshaw is a very atmospheric writer. So you feel like you're right there in the woods with them. And I, I really like her writing. And with this being her... I think this is her first adult book. I and I like the concept a lot. It's just I wish it would have gone in a different direction. So it wasn't bad, but it wasn't a favorite, if that makes sense. I didn't hate it, but it was an easy listen. And I really like the audiobook. But this was only three stars. And I don't want to spoil it. Like if it sounds good to you, it's a quick read. Like go pick it up. I'm curious to see what other people think who have read it. Most people that I've run into have really enjoyed it. I just wish it would have went in a different direction. So three stars and I don't, um, I might keep this on my shelves for a while because I want my friend Adrienne to read it. She literally uses me like a library. She's my best friend and she could go to her own library because she lives in the next town over, but instead she'd rather read the books that I've read. So sometimes I hold on to a couple books just a little bit longer so that she can borrow them and read them. Um, but I got her hooked on Grady Hendrix. She's in the middle of reading all of his books right now. So she's only got two left. She's read Southern Book Club and We Sold Our Souls and I just gave her Horror Store. So all she's got is uh, Best Friends Exorcism and Final Girl Support Group left. So I've, I've gotten her to read some of my favorites. So I might keep this one just to see what she thinks about it. But other after that, it's I think I'm not going to keep it. I think I'm going to donate it because I will never pick it up again. And, you know, it's only a three star. The next book I finished the month of February is Dowry of Blood by S.T. Gibson. This was a gift, a Christmas gift for my friend Harry. So thank you, Harry. Um, this was a quick, quick listen. I, what, it's only 200 pages. It's a novella. And this is a feminist retelling of Dracula's Brides. And I gave it four stars. Absolutely fucking loved it. It wasn't quite five stars for me, but it was really, really good. Um, it's from which which one? I can't remember her name. Oh, Constanza. Um, it's from her point of view. And it is, I don't even know how to describe this. It is so good. If you love Dracula's story at all, if you love horror, I mean, I wouldn't say this is very gory. But it's just, it's so good. It was so good. It's polyamorous and just, oh, I, I don't know. It was just, it was so well written. It was so engaging. Um, but it talks about Constanza being turned by Dracula. And his name is never mentioned. Dracula is never mentioned, but you know who he is. And he turns her and then it shows them moving through Europe and going through different wars and the Black Plague and picking up another bride and like, oh, it was just, I don't know. It would, there was just something about it. If you're interested in Dracula, 
at all or vampires at all it is a quick little novella it is such an easy read but so good so well written and I'd heard so many good things about it and that's why I added it to my wish list and I'm really glad I did because it was fucking fantastic and I'll definitely be keeping this one on my shelves I really really enjoyed it I need to see if S.T. Gibson has written anything else but the writing was really good just the prose like I love the audiobook Oh, it was just so good. If you haven't read it yet, you need to pick it up. It is a nice, quick, easy read. And thank you, Harry, so much for gifting this to me. I absolutely loved it. And there's not much I can really say about it without spoiling it. But there isn't really much to spoil. Because if you know the story of Dracula's Brides, you already know the ending. But it's very much a feminist retelling of it. And I really, really, really enjoyed it. Not quite five stars. More like a 4.5 because I'm getting really stingy with my five stars, but I really, really enjoyed it. Okay, so the next book I have a lot of thoughts about, and I am very much the unpopular opinion. And I think, I don't know if it's because I have a different perspective, but I'm just going to go with, it's because I have a different perspective than other people. And I think that's why I have such strong feelings for this book. Um, but the next book I finished was The Maid by Nita Prose. This is getting, I think this is a debut. This is getting a lot of hype on booktube. I've seen it talked about everywhere. I got it as a book of the month pick because I absolutely like, um, oh, this is just a thrills and chills. This was an add on, but the prose or the prose, the premise just sounded really, really good. So the premise of this book is you're following, what is her name? Molly. You're following a girl named Molly. She is a maid. She is in her early 20s and she works for this hotel. And just from the descriptor, you can tell that she's neurodivergent just from the flap. And she works as a maid in this hotel. She takes pride in her job. And there is a murder in one of the rooms that she cleans. And she is being implicated in this murder. And the story is just about that, what happens, and friends that come to her aid. I was really excited to read this book. Very rarely do you see neurodivergency in books that where it's the main character. And here's where my problem comes in. Okay, so I'm not... Okay, I'm going to spoil kind of... It's not going to be a full spoil. It's going to be a spoiling like smaller plot points. So uh, Molly is clearly autistic. Um, it is not said on page, but I'm a mother of an autistic son and she's autistic 100%. She's a high functioning autistic, but she very much takes everything you say at face value. She does not understand sarcasm. She does not understand like inside jokes or any kind of social cues like that. She she takes everything you say at face value, which is very much how my son is. I mean, my son doesn't speak as well as she does. I mean, this she's obviously high functioning. My son is lower lower functioning. But she gets taken advantage of a lot. Um, and that is the whole fucking plot of this book. Um, yeah, so the whole plot is her being taken advantage of and being used and not knowing that she's being used because of her autism. She doesn't understand what's happening. Like there's this one scene where she goes into this room to clean it and the bartender who works in the hotel and one of the guys that works in the kitchen are in this room with these two other guys that she's never seen before and there's a mess everywhere and they're telling her what's the lie they tell her um that I think his name is Jose who works in the kitchen that his green card is expired or something like that and so he's there illegally now and he's got nowhere to live he's been kicked out of his place and so he stays in an empty room every night so that he has a place to stay and like keeps his job and these other two guys that are in there from what the way it's described in the book as the reader, you can clearly tell that they're dealing drugs and you can clearly tell that they're separating out drugs for sale. Um, I believe it's cocaine, the way it's described because with the powder and stuff. And here's Molly, who has no idea about anything when it comes to drugs and they just blow it off like it's some weird powder that's in there and you know they want her to clean up after them because she's one of the best maids and is very thorough she has OCD tendencies just like my son does so she's very very thorough in her job and she just believes what they say at face value so she cleans up after their drug mess every single fucking day and she tells Jose which room to go into and you find out during the course of the book that Jose 
was roped into this unintentionally. Like he has, he wanted nothing to do with it because he is trying not to get deported and, and wants to remain in the United States because he sends money home to family. The bartender who is the ringleader of all this shit um, pretty much said, I will, you know, have you shit back or I know people in Mexico. I believe that's where he's from, Mexico, to harm your family. So Jose feels like he has to do this, even though he doesn't want to do this. And he feels bad for Molly because he didn't want her to get roped into it. But again, Molly has autism, has no idea what the fuck is going on, and they rope her into this. Then there is this really rich couple who stay there all the time, and they stay in the same room, and Molly is their maid, and Molly has kind of gotten attached to the wife, who is a trophy wife or whatever, and the husband ends up dead, and they end up framing Molly for it, and I mean, here's this poor girl whose grandmother just passed away. Um, her grandmother was the one that helped her get through life and to figure out how to, with social cues, be able to recognize, you know, how to recognize some social cues and how to ask the right questions so she's not out in the cold or, you know, made fun of. And it, it's just, with that happening and then this man dying and they framed her for it, it just pissed me off so much. And the way that it framed her for, I mean, it was just this guy, the bartender guy, just using her disability as to his advantage. And because she acts so different, because she does have autism, like she doesn't respond in the certain ways that you would expect people to. So when the cops interview her, they just think she's a cold hearted bitch. No, she's not. She has autism. I mean, the ending was good. Like, the doorman has happens to have a daughter who's a hotshot lawyer and, like, you know, helps get her off and, like, you know, gets the first-degree murder charges thrown out because she didn't do anything. And they run this elaborate scheme to tra entrap the bartender so that he admits to what he did and all this shit. But about halfway through, when all this shit was happening to her, I had to put down the book. I almost DNF'd it because this is one of the biggest fears I have for my son so this is very much triggering for me, very specific, a very specific trigger. Neurodivergent or autistic people being taken advantage of because of their disability and how trusting they are. Huge trigger for me as a mom of a child with autism. And my son is lower functioning. So, I mean, it probably this probably wouldn't happen to him. But he's also very trusting of certain people. Like if he really likes you he would probably do pretty much whatever you said. I mean, he couldn't do something. He couldn't be in a situation like this because he doesn't communicate. So it wouldn't work. But it, it's just that's one of my biggest fears is my son being taken advantage of. And so to see Molly, I mean, through the whole book being taken advantage of. And as the reader, you can see what's happening to her. And she doesn't understand. I mean, it did end well for her. But at the same fucking time, it, it just made me really, really upset and I think that the author could have written a neurodivergent character like Molly because the, the way she was written, now I am not an autistic person or neurodivergent in that way, but I'm a mother of someone who is. And I think the representation from a mother's perspective was good. Like the way that she acted, the way that she talked, the way that she received emotion like and reacted to other people's emotion, her inner monologue, like I think it was... A pretty decent representation. I just wish it wasn't used in this way to where she was taken advantage of. I wish it was more that because of her really good cleaning skills or her OCD and the way just her own skills that she has from being autistic was used to help solve the crime or something like that. Not that because she's neurodivergent and because she has autism that all the bad characters use that to their advantage to frame her and to use her as their mule that made me so fucking pissed off. And it's like, ugh. and like Jose, like he knew what was going on and he likes Molly and they end up getting dating at the end. It's like, but you didn't step in and help her, bitch. Like I just, there's certain things, there was just certain things that just bothered me. You can write an autistic or neurodivergent character who is high functioning Who's, who is just like Molly and that good representation, but not have them being taken advantage of. I think that's what made me so mad is that the entire book is her being taken advantage of. It's like, can we write a story about an autistic person in a thrilling thriller mystery 
where their autistic traits and their hyper focus on certain things is used for good. Like, uh, I don't know. I don't know. It just, it really triggered me and it really pissed me off. And I, you know, it, I have a hard time finding books with good autistic representation to where the autistic person isn't framed for a crime or their disability is made fun of or used as a crutch or used as something to almost like a Molly Sue to make, not a Molly Sue, um, like a Manic Pixie Dream Girl where it's like that autistic person is that just there to make the main character a better person because they connected with somebody who is neurodivergent and not like themselves. Can we have a main character who has autism or is neurodivergent to where their skills and their particular neuroses are used to do something good and not to be used against them? Does that make sense? I would also like to see there was only one book that I've ever read and I gave it five stars and it's usually a book that I don't read very often. It's a contemporary, just a basic contemporary literary fiction. It's right down there. It's called Other People's Houses uh, by Abby Waxman. That was the only book I have ever read that had an accurate representation of somebody on the autism spectrum that is right about where my son is. Um, it, he was not very high functioning. He wasn't very verbal. And it was from the mother's perspective and how she dealt with it and the feeling she had as a parent. And I guess I just, of course, related very much to this woman because I've been in that boat and I know what it feels like. And I wish there were more books like that where it's not just a neurodivergent or an autistic person who is high on the spectrum to where they can walk, they can talk, they can interact, they can function on their own, like they can live on their own and pay their bills and work. My son will live with me for the rest of his life. He probably will never have a job. And if he does, it's got to be very low to where he can he can do it himself. Um, he'll never be able to handle his own money. Like I said, he will live with us for the rest of his life. He can't hold a conversation with you. He can talk and he can answer questions. But if you ask him, how was your day at school today, Lucas? He'll go, have a good day at school. And that's it. Like, if you ask him, like, I will ask him, what'd you do in PE today? And he will look at me and you can see the wheels turning in his head. And he he might say something, but he mumbles a little bit and he str struggles getting the words out. So it, Tim, I always describe it as it's like the two parts of the brain, the the part that knows what to say and what he wants to say and then the ability to say it that bridge is broken and there's just little hodgepodge pieces to get across instead of a full normal bridge and so he's got to really struggle to cross that bridge to get out what he wants to say and they're all you see in literature and in tv shows is autistic kids who are very high functioning and just have like behavioral issues or you know social issues there's way more to it than that and so I don't think this was a good choice for me because, again, you know, I've rambled on for like 10 minutes. Very triggered um, because it just pissed me off. Like, I would like to see, again, I'd like to see a book where there's somebody who is neurodivergent or has autism that is not being taken advantage of or just like that literary fiction that I read where, you know, obviously you can't really write a story from that character's point of view if they're lower functioning, but from the parent's point of view. And that was great representation. I wonder if the author herself has an autistic child because I related to it so hard. It was so spot on being a parent of an autistic child that it was just like, holy shit. But this was two fucking stars just because she was taken, taken advantage of. I think she was written very well. I think the representation was rather decent. You'd have to be, you know, and I am not an autistic person. I'm just a mother of one. So just from my point of view, I think that she was well written in the way she talks, the way she reacts. I think that was good representation. Again, take that with a grain of salt. But this was two stars and it's going in the donate pile. And I was really disappointed with it. Okay, again, there probably was an angle change and I can't seem to get this right. And my ring light's being stupid and my stand's being stupid. So again, apologies, this is a hodgepodge video, but we got two books left. Uh, the next book that I finished was A Flicker in the Dark by Stacey Willingham. And this was three stars. So this tells the story of a woman, I can't even remember her name, Chloe. 
uh, who, when she was a kid, her dad was arrested and charged with the murder of these girls that were happening in her town. And now that she's an adult, she's engaged to be married and these murders have started happening again. And they're all kind of closely related to Chloe, like people that she's been around. And so she's trying to figure out who's killing these girls because her dad is in prison and has been for like 20 something years. So this was a fast read. Like I got through it pretty quick. I listened on audio, but it was really predictable. Um, there's not many people in her life. So really the killer could be one of two people. And they try to push you really hard towards the one. So it's obvious it's not him. It's going to be the other person. So, you know, it's kind of like one of those where it's like, either it's going to be the narrator and they're just super unreliable and you're going to throw something out there like they're having blackouts so we're just not being told or it's going to be one of these two other characters that are the only real other side characters and people in her life and I was right it was one of them um it was <sighs> there was nothing in it that surprised me it wasn't bad it was an easy read and easy to get get through but uh, like a not as, uh, see, it was predictable for me, but I don't think it was where I didn't figure it out, like, on page eight. It was, still figured it out relatively early, but still enjoyed the ride, if that makes sense. It was still easy to read, easy to listen to and get through, and wasn't terrible, but it wasn't a favorite either. And, either. and thrillers are really hard for me to rate higher than, like, a four, maybe. They're usually right around a three, or they're terrible and they're lower than that. But very rarely would I ever give a thriller five stars. But this was three stars. It was not bad. If you're interested in it and want to try it out, I highly suggest you do. It was, the audiobook was good and the story wasn't bad. It was an interesting story, but the ending was kind of predictable, but it wasn't bad. Okay, and the last book I finished, um, I just read it on a room, read it in two days. And this was a gift also. This was a gift from April, who is on... Becca's Discord. So thank you again, April. This is for Christmas. And I read Come With Me by Ronald Malfi. So this was in the horror, Goodreads Choice Awards horror section. But this ain't horror um, at all. This, it, I think this is more of a mystery. And I miss really, not a, it's not a thriller though. Kind of, kind of a mystery thriller. But I do not understand why it was classified as horror. Because this definitely is not horror. Um, this tells the story of Aaron and Allison, um, and you learn right on from the very early part of the book, um, Aaron's wife, Allison, is murdered in a mall shooting, like senselessly murdered. It's like in the first 10 pages. And so he's dealing with that. And then he gets, um, he was looking through some of her stuff and found a receipt for a hotel in like North Carolina. And they live somewhere up north on the East Coast. But he was like, well, why was she, what was she doing down there? I didn't think she, you know, had anything going on with, because she's a newspaper reporter for their town, like this small town. So she talks to her boss and he finds out that she was never sent down there. So it's kind of like becomes a story of him trying to figure out what his wife was doing. And he uncovers a whole bunch of stuff. So I don't know how much to say that would be considered spoilers for this. Um... It's not horror. It's definitely 100% a mystery. Uh, I gave this three stars. It was not, it was not bad. I listened to the audio. It was really engaging. Uh, the author did a really good job dealing with grief and showcasing grief. Aaron is very clearly grieving and he is the narrator. And, but as he's narrating, it's like he's talking to his wife, Allison. So he goes, you know, I knew you wouldn't do this, Allison, or, you know, I thought of you when they said that, Allison. It's like he's talking to her, even though she's dead. So, you know, it's obviously very much about grief. Um, secrets we keep from our, our spouses or our families in general. Now, the secret that she's keeping is not necessarily a bad one. I mean, she's a journalist, so, but it ties back to her family and there's all these murders I guess I'll say, I mean, it's, I don't think this is necessarily a spoiler, um, but he very quickly finds out as he's going through her things that they have at the house and stuff like that, 
that she's been investigating all these murders of these teenage girls over the course of 20 years. And she thinks they're all linked. She thinks there's a serial killer. And so she's trying, and one of the sisters that was murdered, one of the first ones was her sister. So she's trying to figure out or make connections to try to figure out who this serial killer is. And that's why she's doing all this traveling and talking to people and stuff like that. She's a journalist. So he kind of picks up where she leaves off and starts, you know, trying to figure it out for himself. So you go through the story, the mystery is solved, um, shit happens. And then the very, very, very end, that kind of surprised me. I didn't see that coming. So the very last twist at the end, didn't see that coming, but also thought it was a fitting ending. But it still wasn't more than three stars. It wasn't, it's not like I've never read anything like this before. Not exactly like this. It wasn't some over the top story, but it wasn't bad either. I, I liked the writing. It was easy to read. I didn't really like Aaron being like talking, like he was talking to Allison as he's telling you the story of what happened and what they did. Um, but I don't know. It just wasn't anything better than a three. It was okay. It was not bad. It was not amazing, but it was, it was okay. And I liked the concept of the story of, you know, him picking up where she left off and finishing her research and figuring out what happened to these girls and who the killer was. And he did figure it out. He did solve the mystery. So I, while I enjoyed it, I won't read this again. So I'm going to be donating it to my friend Sarah for her to read. Thank you again, April for gifting this to me. I'm glad it's, it's a Bram Stoker award finalist, which is funny to me because it's not a horror novel at all. Like it's not supernatural. There's no monsters. It is, there's no gore. It's not horror. It's 100% a mystery. And it, it was a, it was a decent mystery, but it, this is not horror. Um, but thank you again, April. Um, if you, if this does sound interesting, please pick it up. It, it was it was a decent reading. It was a quick read. I read it in two days. Okay, guys, that's it. That is my March or my March wrap up. It's my February wrap up. So those are the five books I read and the two books that are whatever they are. Um, but yeah, February started out great and then ended really shitty and March has started out shitty. So the next couple of months are going to be rough for me. So we'll, we'll see how things go. Um, I'm going to try to read as much as possible. So we'll see what happens. Uh, but yeah, that this is where I'm at. Like, I'm sorry, I feel really scatterbrained. Um, and I'm pretty stressed out. So we'll see how it goes. We'll see how March goes. I'm going to try to read because hopefully I can like, you know, if I what if I if I do a reread of Akatar and I listen to it, I mean, I can breeze through those really fucking fast. And they're like comfort reads. And I usually don't reread shit. I also have the entire Red Sister series on audio that I could listen to also comfort listens. We'll see. But I might do that. You know, just make March just comfort read month just so I feel better. Might pick up something new. We'll see. We'll see. I, I mean, I have options. I just everything looks good and nothing looks good. So that's kind of where I'm at. And I hate it. I hate it because I'm not in a slump because I do want to read. I just don't know what the fuck I want to read. So but that's it, guys. That is my February wrap up. Please let me know in the comments down below if you've read any of these books and what you thought of them. Um, what did you guys read in February? Hopefully March is going better for you than it is for me so far. But I have like a couple of ideas of a couple of videos I might want to do. We'll see how I feel. Um, but until then, I if I don't put those out, then it'll the next thing you'll see from me will be my April TBR. Um, cause with everything going on, I just don't have the motivation to do anything else, but just to let you guys know. So other than that, that's it guys. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye.